All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's a few minutes after noon. Uh, I imagine that some more folks will continue to join us throughout the session. Um, but I wanna welcome you to our now virtual financial literacy series that is hosted by the Graduate College, as well as our sponsored partners, um, the Graduate Student Association and the Drexel Biomedical Graduate Association. Um, so this is uh, one of many talks that we feature annually, um, so I encourage you to head to the website uh, for the materials and recordings of our other talks that might be of interest to you. I've just uh, included the link to the website in the chat. Um, we do ask that all of our guests today um, just remain on mute for the duration of the formal presentation, um, and if you have questions, comments, um, just type them into the chat during the presentation and I'll try to make sure that uh, Michael addresses those for us today. And then we'll also have plenty of time at the end for some question and answer uh, from our speaker. Uh, today's session is also being recorded. So if you miss anything, have to leave us a little early. Um, we do encourage you to check out the recording and I'll be sending that out um, as well. And it will also be on the website that I've included in the chat. Uh, so feel free to share it with other colleagues or friends who can benefit from the information. And then finally, I do want to remind everyone we have one more uh, financial literacy session in June, uh, which will be part two of this talk, Advanced Investing, uh, which will feature a faculty member from the College of Business. So we do encourage you all to come to that as part two. Um, but without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Michael Clancy, who is the Director of Financial Planning in the Division of Medical Education in the College of Medicine here at Drexel. Uh, Michael's been doing these sessions for us now for about two years, and they're very well received. So thank you to Michael for continuing to uh, offer us this information, especially in these uh, trying times. So I'll have Michael share his screen and some information with you all, and I'll check back in uh, for our Q&A. Michael. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, let's see if we can uh, bring up the slides here. Everyone should be seeing the, the main slide that we keep using each year. Um, yes, we are all set. Perfect. Um, let's see if we can advance it a little bit. There we go. Uh, as we talked about, we had some prior sessions from last fall, beginning uh, accounts oriented budgeting credit. We did home buying last November, and who can forget the tax talk back in January. Uh, so today we're going to start on investments. Now we got a nice famous quote from a famous person we've all heard of. Um, we're going to jump right into the various goals for today's um, talk. We're going to talk about savings versus investing goal setting, how to set up your own personal goals. We're going to do a deeper dive on the types of investment accounts that people use uh, with the specific emphasis on the retirement type accounts that you would come across, you know, as you work throughout your career. Uh, we're going to bring up matching contributions, things like that, other type of employee benefits. Uh, we will go into a little bit on investor behavior, the, the traps that people fall into. We're going to start talking about diversification, it's something you hear about a lot. And I always tie everything back to taxes. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the tax influence on investments. So initially, here's our first set of goals that we wanna talk about. When I use the word savings versus investing, I always wanna uh, draw a distinction between the two. Some people use it interchangeably, but think of savings as for emergency purposes or some type of spend that you're gonna have in a relatively short time from now. Why that's important is that money needs to be kept relatively safe, no fluctuation in value, needs to be accessible. Uh, the terminology you'll hear is liquidity. You're able to access that money without a cost or significant reduction. There's no penalty to get at it. There's no potential for loss. Very safe, again, no fluctuations. When I use the term investments or investing, we're thinking about longer time frames, further down the road, potential to grow the money over time, which brings with it the potential to lose value at any given time. If this were our emergency dollars, we wouldn't want to take that risk with it. 
if it's something that we're going to be spending a short time from now, maybe next year, while we might miss out on a potential to grow over that next year, we can't take the risk that we might lose value by the time that we actually need it. So think of savings, very safe, accessible, short-term needs, investments, potential for growth, potential for loss, but generally growth over time, longer term timeframes. What are we thinking about when we're thinking about savings? We're thinking about bank oriented products. You're checking your savings account, certificate of deposits, things like that. They don't lose money. Money market accounts, money market mutual funds, keep a very stable uh, value to them and provide a certain level of dividends. Very little right now, uh, but again, it's the safety and liquidity that we're looking for. U.S. savings bonds could also be considered a very safe uh, storage of money. Fixed annuities for those in the retirement years over age 59 and a half have um, certificate de deposit like features. So again, a fixed annuity could be used for a short term period of time. When we're talking about investments, we're thinking of things such as stocks, bonds, mutual funds, account uh, investments that fluctuate over time, real estate, very long term aspect to it, not very liquid. If you had to sell a house today, you might not get your full value for it. So again, it's not we're not using real estate for the safe or emergency purposes, but we could potentially use it for a long-term investment. Variable life insurance, variable annuities. These are more insurance-oriented products that have an investment flavor to them. Uh, but then again, fixed annuities could also be considered a very conservative type of investment um, for longer time periods. Now, for you personally, you want to think about why you're investing in the first place. What are your goals? Is it something um, long-term oriented, such as for your retirement years? Is it relatively near or midterm needed, such as putting a child through college, paying for a child's wedding, buying that vacation house that we're dreaming of, things like that. So when we think about the, all the different types of investment goals you may have, start to put them in time periods, whether it's, let's say, three to five years from now, five to 10 years from now, 20 or more years down the road. So start thinking in order of time. Now, when we think about time, there's two senses to it. There's the time frame until you would need that money. And then there's the time frame of use. How fast are we going to use it? Is it a couple years from now? Is it 12 years from now when the child enters college? Is it 25 years from now when you retire? But then again, are we paying for retirement all at once or are we paying for retirement over a series of years? I've had clients back from my wealth management days who would write one big check and buy in to a lifetime continuing care retirement community. They're done. They've paid for all the retirement up front. Or maybe we are withdrawing from our accounts to pay for our year over our monthly bills throughout our retirement years. Your life expectancy, if you've never looked up what your life expectancy is, that's always a fun exercise. Your life expectancy is a lot longer than mine. So you could be living several decades in those retirement years and need to withdraw money every one of those years. Is it a putting a child through college? When I started saving for my kids' college back when they were born, that was a long-term goal. Now they're all in college. So we are actually in the withdrawal period. So again, the time frame until something is needed, but then again, the time frame of how you're going to use it. Obviously, the longer you wait to get to, you know, working towards these goals, the more it's going to cost you. You know, a lot of people get bogged down in the terminology and the lingo and the different types of accounts that you would put your money in to invest. So we're going to talk about the types of accounts and how those match up with the type of goals that you have two very, very broad category of investment accounts. The accounts are either taxable or they are what are known as tax deferred. If it's a taxable account, it means all the activity in that account, interest, dividends, capital gains, anything that happens in any given year will be reported on that year's tax return. It could even be a loss that you're selling something at a loss, it actually shows up on your tax return or you're selling something at a gain 
all those interest and dividends. You would pay tax on it each and every year that there's that activity. If it's a tax deferred account, all that activity, the transactions from selling, gains, losses, interest, dividends, capital gains, and so forth, do not show up on your tax return in any of those years. The money's still inside that account, it is not reflected on your tax return. So broad category, it's either taxable or it's tax deferred. What are we thinking about when we talk about taxable accounts? These are brokerage or investment accounts in your own name individually, or possibly a joint account with a spouse. It could be a custodial account that you have set up for a minor child. And even could be a trust account that gets set up. A lot of people, the misnomer is they think trusts save on taxes, but actually trust accounts are very inefficient when it comes to the taxability of the investments inside the account. Tax deferred accounts, we're talking about your retirement oriented products that you get through your employer, such as a 401k plan, 403b plan, 457 plans, thrift savings plan, what you see the TSP, if you're a federal employer or if you're working for the federal government, could be a personal retirement account, such as an IRA. You heard about traditional IRAs, rollover IRAs, Roth IRAs, even SEP IRAs for the self-employed person. It could be a 529 account, which is specific to college use. So when we start to identify different goals, we can actually identify the right account for that goal. Annuities are also, the intent is for the retirement years, life insurance products um, have other elements such as a death benefit. It's used a lot for estate planning needs or possibly business related needs. Healthcare savings accounts that your employer may offer if you sign up for a, health, a high deductible health insurance. We've talked about this a lot in the tax class, specific to medical purposes, but it's actually a very efficient, very tax efficient type of an account. But we can't mix. We're not using the healthcare savings account to meet our college planning goal, nor are we using the college planning, the 529 account to meet our medical expenses. So when we start to identify the goal, then we can start to identify the right account for that goal. Let's talk about retirement accounts. 401ks, 403bs, or your traditional IRA versus the Roth version of those accounts. It could be a Roth IRA, it could be a Roth 401k or Roth 403b through your employer. So how do we differentiate? The traditional form of the accounts Typically the money goes in, you get a tax deduction for your contribution that year or what they call upfront. These accounts are tax deferred. So over the years, there's no taxes on the, the, the activity inside those accounts. But upon withdrawal, you report that as income and pay tax on the amount withdrawn. The Roth version of those accounts, you do not get a tax deduction the year the money goes in. It is still tax deferred the entire time that money is inside the account, but then it would be tax free or no tax upon withdrawal. So you either got the deduction up front and pay tax coming out, or you pay tax on your money before it goes in and then it's tax free coming out. So there's the traditional version versus the Roth version. Some of these 401ks, 403b plans that would be offered through your employment, you have the ability to borrow against the money that is inside that account. There are taxes and penalties if you take the withdrawals before certain ages. You are required to eventually start taking money out at a certain age. Notice I've highlighted age 72. That's the new year, that's the new age. It had been 70 and a half for, for decades. It recently changed. So that's why I highlighted it there. In case you come across a number like 70 and a half, that's old information. The dollar limit, how much you can contribute towards that employer's plan was recently raised to 19,500. That's why I have it highlighted there. That number slowly increases as the years go by. For the traditional IRA, it's a $6,000 a year limit. That happens to be the same limit from last year. That's why it's not highlighted. The Roth versions, let's say it's a Roth IRA. Believe it or not, you can withdraw your contribution at any time, no tax and penalty. I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper on that in a second. Again, penalty, if you take money out, especially the, the employer Roth 401ks, 403bs before a certain age. However, no required distribution. 
So that Roth IRA versus the traditional IRA, traditional IRA, you have to start taking money out age 72 and above. The Roth IRA, you do not. Still, we have the 19,500 limit on the employer, Roth 401ks, 403bs, and the $6,000 a year limit on what you can contribute to a Roth IRA. Now, here's what I meant by the individual Roth IRA. The money you put in is considered a contribution. The account could grow in value, it could also lose money, but the overall account is made up of really two components. It's made up of what you've put in, plus all the earnings or growth on those investments. The amount that you contribute is always available to you. So one tip that I suggest for people starting out in their careers, if they are sitting on some money in their bank savings account and that was their emergency money, they need to keep it very safe, very liquid. What I would suggest sometimes is to put that money into a Roth IRA, still invest it extremely safe so we don't have the fluctuations in value. If we have that emergency or even a non-emergency, you could actually pull that contribution back out of the Roth IRA at, at any time. It is a first in, first out type of a, an accounting such that the custodian, where you have your investment account, gives you your money back before they give you any of the growth. So if we only have so many dollars and we haven't contributed to a Roth that year, but we have money set aside for emergencies, I would suggest putting that emergency money into a Roth. It's always available. Keep it very stable so it's very safe. If we don't have that emergency and we in the future build up more money in our bank account, at least we got the money into the Roth while we were still eligible and it could serve for some longer term purpose as well. Now, some considerations, like I said, tax-free withdrawals during re your retirement years. Again, you can always remove your contributions at any time, even prior to retirement. There are income eligibility limits, which I think I show on probably the next slide. You could convert existing pre-tax retirement accounts like that traditional IRA into a Roth IRA. However, that pre-tax amount would be taxed that year. So if you're in a low income year, maybe we take advantage of the low taxes and convert those old retirement plans into the Roth, pay the tax if there is any that year, but at least you get the growth tax-free in retirement. I do this a lot with grad students, especially if we had that prior career coming back to grad school where we have an old IRA or an old retirement plan from a prior employer, while we're in grad school, we're in a low to no tax you know, environment, I would do a bunch of Roth IRA conversions during those years. And then eventually in retirement, that money is now tax free. So we wanna take advantage of the low income years to do those convert conversions. You'll hear a lot about matching contributions. What are people talking about? This is through your employer. Let's say using, let's lose the numbers on the screen, you have $100,000 your salary, you're putting 4% of your wages into your retirement plan. Let's give it a hypothetical rate of return of 6%. That's really $333 a month you're contributing. Over time, that account would grow to approximately 220,000. If you were getting a raise each of those years, you're still doing a 4% of your salary, which is increasing. So you can see that your same contribution rate you're taking advantage of your raises to increase your contribution would grow to be about 294. Now your employer may offer what's called a match. They're matching the dollars that you're putting in. So you're putting in 4%. In this example, the employer's matching 50% of that, which means they're putting in 2%. You're still putting in your four. They're just simply putting extra dollars in. It's an employee retention tool. A lot of employers would offer this as an employee benefit. Um, if you're evaluating two jobs where you're indifferent between either position and one employer offers a match, maybe that would tilt it in favor to say, hey, I'm gonna take that job with the employer that has the matching contributions. You can see with the same fact pattern, you're still putting in the same amount, but with the matching dollars, the account value is growing to be much higher. Now this is what gets investors into trouble they typically jump right to what to invest in without thinking about their goals, without thinking about the proper accounts and so forth. 
So there's a lot of investor behavior that tends to hold us back. What I'm talking about are things like this. When the stock market or the investments are doing extremely well, we tend to buy more at these higher prices. Then when things aren't doing well and they've dropped in value, we sell. So what are we doing? We're buying high and we're selling low. It's human nature. It's counter to what you're trying to accomplish. You might say, oh, that's not going to be, that doesn't happen. Yes, it does. Uh, this chart I love using because prior to the left-hand side of the chart was what was known as the dot-com bubble in the 90s where stocks got overinflated and then they come crashing down. Then in the middle, you can see we had that real estate bubble going up to a peak. And then if you remember right, we had a real estate crash about 10 years ago. And then since then, we've had an asset and liquidity commodity bubble ever since for the past 10 or 12 years. And if you've been watching the news, you've seen what happened about a month or so ago. So this type of pattern does happen. When things are doing extremely well, everyone jumps on, they get into the investments. When things crash, they sell, they get out, and they miss that run up again. So you'll hear about investments and what they return over a long period of times, but investors actually never really benefit from that rate of return that an investment generally gives because of their own behavior. Buying too much of one thing, selling at the wrong times and all that sort of stuff. So how do we mitigate that? Well, have that long-term perspective so that we're not making decisions based on short-term swings. You can also diversify across multiple types of assets to invest in so that when one is doing well and another's not doing as well, you get a blended return. So what are we talking about when we talk about diversifications? We're talking about various what are known as asset classes, stocks. Bonds are a different type of investment. Cash, very liquid, is actually an asset class. Real estate can be a form of investment. Commodities, also things such as oil and gas, gold, silver, things of that nature, used to be very hard for a personal investor to actually make investments in commodities. It's actually very easy now. So a person would invest, instead of all in one thing, they can invest across multiple types of investments so that when things are going well in one, you benefit a little, when things are going bad in one of these asset classes, you're not harmed as much. We're talking about, again, multiple types of investments. And the theory behind it, like I said, is that if you're invested all one way or the other, your rate of return and your experiences are going to be subject to these whipsaws up and down versus if you have a little bit of everything, you'll have a blended rate and you'll have a smoother rate of return, which will keep you invested. I like to use this, this type of a chart to kind of prove the point. The blue line represents an investment portfolio that is 100% invested in the US large cap stock market, the S&P 500. The green line represents a blended portfolio. Let's say 60% invested in the stock market and 40% invested in the bond market. They tend to move in lockstep, but to a a smaller extent. If you look at the 2007 through 2009, from peak to trough, if you were 100% in stock, you would have felt that entire decline. If you were in that blended portfolio, it would not have lost as much, which means from an investor standpoint, you probably would have stuck with it. You would have ridden it out. I've had plenty of clients, in fact, I had one that called me on March 9th, 2009, which is the absolute bottom there on the chart, couldn't take that experience, that stock market drop, sold everything. Now that same investor probably would not have reinvested until much later on, missing that run up. So again, if, if, if we have that long-term perspective, we're more likely to stick with it. You notice how I had the slide end where they both ended at the same spot. Now in reality, that 100% stock portfolio will outperform that diversified portfolio over long periods of time. But if we sold out, we never would have realized those returns. So it's more about sticking with the plan long-term than it is trying to get the absolute highest rate of return. Because by reaching 
for the highest rate of return, we could potentially suffer larger losses or possibly get out altogether and never complete our goal. Look at, look at this slide, look at the long-term nature of it. Is it very obvious where that 2009 drop was? Yeah, it was way in the lower left-hand corner. You can see since then, the stock market has more than made up for those losses, but not for the person who sold out when things were bad. They would have missed that run up. Now, if we wanna go a little bit closer to um, today, you can see more volatility. It's not always a smooth ride. This slide gives us, I think the past five years, and you can see towards the right, a lot of that activity this year alone. And I, I think the slide is at least a week old. So things have done well this week. Who knows what today brings? Who knows what tomorrow brings? But long-term, the trend is always up. So how do we go about investing? Well, if you think about it, through your workplace, the money is going in every paycheck through that 401k, 403b. So you're buying a little bit over long periods of time. So make it investments part of your budget. Whether we can set aside some money monthly, yearly, maybe it's upon our tax refund, maybe it's through our workplace employer plan. Take that balanced approach, keep it as simple as you can. That way you're more likely to stick with it. You're gonna see lots of pie charts. The investment community loves pie charts. If you are what's considered an aggressive investor, then a larger percentage of your investments would be in the more risky or aggressive growth oriented investments. If you're a more moderate or even a conservative investor, a larger portion of your investments would be in the safer, less growth oriented types of investments. You'll see both in college saving plans and employer retirement plans, a lot of what they call target retirement date funds, things of that nature, they're designed so that when you invest in that, let's say target retirement date, 2050 fund or 2060 fund, something like that, when you're young, it starts out fully diversified across, let's say that aggressive pie chart, and it will autopilot over time, become more moderate than very conservative, closer and closer you get towards that target retirement date. The theory behind it is this way, every dollar is fully invested, it's appropriately invested based on the long-term nature of the investment, but then it gets more conservative for you close to the years that you will be making withdrawals. Again, if we need that money, if we need to pull that money out every year to pay for our bills, we want it to re remain relatively stable. Someone my age, I might be in the 2030 fund. So it gets very conservative by the, by the year 2030 when I'm ready to retire or someone younger might have a more aggressive standpoint and pick a further date fund, like a 2040, 2050 or so. You'll see this a lot in the college savings accounts when the child or the beneficiary of the account is very young, let's say under age five, it might be very aggressively invested. And then when they hit the high school years, it becomes more moderate. And then ultimately in the college years becomes very conservative so that way, when you're withdrawing the money for those college years, which is a very short period of time, let's say a four or more years, you need to pull out all of that money. We need a lot of stability with it. So there are these autopilot ways to invest that take the year by year rebalancing decisions and allocation and diversification decisions out of your hands and do it for you automatically. You might see variations of this with a lot of the apps that are out there, these um, uh, new web-based or what they call robo-advisor solutions that will diversify a portfolio for you regardless of how small your account is. So speaking of the apps and so forth, where can you do your investments? You can do it through banks, trust companies, brokerage firms. There are a lot of the online only types firms that you come across. Insurance companies would love to do your investments for you. There are a lot of name brand mutual fund companies that can do a host of investing for you. There are a lot of personal advisors that you could hire. I used to work for several advisory firms. I used to work for Vanguard, MetLife, Merrill Lynch in my background. Um, would gladly take you on as a client. Some have limits. Um, 
Some you have to be wealthy in order to hire them in the first place. But again, these are some name brands that you might hear and literally there's thousands of personal advisors that you've never heard of. Now what you obviously can invest in, we talked about stocks, bonds, mutual funds, but there could be some very esoteric types of investments out there that you would never think of. Uh, horse breeding, collectibles, Bitcoin as an investment, life settlements, litigation finance, commodities, various types of real estate, tax credit programs, and so forth. So the more sophisticated and more wealth that you have, there are more options that would help diversify it. Now I highlighted mutual funds here because that's where most people get their start. What is a mutual fund? A mutual fund is very simply a collection of investor funds used to purchase investments on their behalf. Shares of the mutual fund are priced at the end of the day after expenses are removed based on the value of all the investments in that mutual fund divided by the number of shares. So after the market closes, everything that the mutual fund is owned is priced divided by the number of shares and that's how they come up with a share price for that mutual fund. It is managed by a fund company. This is where you've heard of companies like Vanguard, Fidelity and so forth. This is what they do all day long. Now, these types of mutual funds come in various flavors. It could be very narrowly focused, just a mutual fund that only invests in US stocks. It could only invest maybe in US large cap stocks or very small company stocks or something like that. Or it can be very broad where it invests in stocks globally around the world or multiple asset classes where it would invest in both stocks and bonds just in the one investment. So again, you could do it very narrowly focused or it could be very, very broad. It could follow a set list, which means it's an index fund or it's referred to as passive. If you buy a mutual fund that invests in the S&P or Standard Poor's 500, it is simply buying all 500 companies, that's it. It buys them pro rata, more of company number one, less of company number 500, but it follows that, that index or that list. There's no discretion. Or maybe it has a fund manager, it's called an active fund, where the fund manager picks and chooses what companies to invest in, what companies to sell, what companies to avoid. That's more active. There's lots of trading going on. They tend to have to pay the fund manager, which makes it a more expensive investment over time. Index, there's no fund manager. There's no discretion. There's no research. It just buys the companies and it's done. That active fund manager has to investigate, has to hire analysts and so forth. So there's more expense to run that fund. Now remember, the share price is determined based on the assets that it owns that day, minus the expenses of running the fund. So the cheaper, or, or let's say it this way, the more expensive it costs to run that fund, the more that fund has to out earn in order to give you a good rate of return. The cheaper or the index approach is a very low cost way to invest, so therefore, it doesn't have to out-earn its expenses. You'll hear about uh, you'll hear a lot of lingo around the categories. It could be a growth-oriented investment. It could be a value-oriented investment. Growth investing means that it focuses on companies that managers believe will experience faster than average growth of sales, as measured by revenue or earnings or things of that nature. They're looking for the next product. They are trying to grow the value of the company. Value-oriented investments focuses on companies whose fundamental worth is based on the products they already have. They primarily use their earnings that they make each year to pay back to the investors in the form of dividends. The growth-oriented company would take its earnings each year and plow it into research and develop it into the next great invention. Think of the value-type companies like could be banks, could be utilities. There's nothing new in electricity, whereas Computer-oriented companies, they have to come out with the next computer. They have to come out with the next investment, the next pharmaceutical product or whatever. So there are ways that you can invest in one over the other. Now, before we start talking about taxes, we're gonna start talking about taxes. That value-oriented investment is gonna kick off a lot of dividends versus that growth-oriented investment may not. And if this is a taxable account, we're gonna be paying tax on those dividends. So we start to think about what to invest in and what accounts in order to minimize taxes. We are gonna talk more about taxes. 
market capitalization, you hear me use the phrase large cap, mid, small. Large cap is simply the largest companies per market value. These are companies that are worth probably 10 billion or more. Mid cap, again, that two to 10 billion range, small cap under $2 billion. The whole company is worth less than $2 billion. <coughs> Morningstar uh, came out with what they called their style boxes. They came out a couple decades ago. They split everything up. Is it a large cap company? Is it growth or value oriented? And they came up with this grid. So when you hear me talk about the large cap part of the marketplace, that's the S&P 500. It's company number one, which is either Amazon or Apple, something like that. Google maybe down to company number 500. Mid cap would be 501 to maybe 1500. And then 1500 on would be your small cap companies. If you took a dollar and spread it out across all the US companies based on their worth, roughly 75 to 80 cents of that dollar would be in those top 500 companies. That's how large they are compared to the other 3,500 companies on the stock exchange. So the very large are extremely large. I kind of hinted at this earlier, costs are a drag. The cost could be the commission where you have to actually pay someone in order to buy something. It could be the transaction cost. Every time you're buying or selling, that brokerage firm might charge you $5 a trade to both buy and then to sell something. It could be that expense ratio with that, uh, that mutual fund. If it's a higher cost fund, they're constantly taking their expenses off at the end of every day. So the lower the expense ratio, the better it is for you. The cost could also be the tax. Again, if we buy something, we sell it at a gain, we have to pay a capital gain on our gains, our capital gain tax. So a lot of times you might see rates of returns. That's great. But then we have to look at the after tax rate of return. So again, we have to think about taxes with this. So I keep talking about taxes. We're going to take, do a deeper dive. If you remember from the, the tax class, kind of showed you, you know, an individual tax return. Everything shows up on there. Your income from jobs, interest, dividends, capital gains. If you're a landlord, the rents you receive, the net rents. If you produce something, copyright something, the royalties um, that you're receiving on your inventions. If you are part of a partnership, the partnership payouts. Again, everything hits the tax return. Now, we also talked about tax brackets. So for right now, picture that future job. You've probably researched what your profession pays on average for salaries, whether you're new to the career or further on. What tax bracket are you going to fall in just based on your job income? Now, maybe we're in the 22% the tax bracket and our investments generated a $100 dividend. Well, in the 22% bracket, you just lost $22 due to tax. So in that taxable account, maybe we're not gonna invest in value-oriented investments or taxable bonds that would generate income that we now have to pay tax on each and every year. Instead, maybe we focus on the growth-oriented growth investments that don't necessarily generate taxable income. If we're investing in a tax deferred account, we don't care about the year to year dividends and things of that nature because we're not paying taxes on it. What tax bracket are you in at the early part of your career? What tax bracket are you in during your peak earning years? And then eventually what tax bracket are we in in retirement? Is again, remember, we're putting money aside, we're getting the tax deduction, but we will eventually pay tax on those withdrawals and we have to pay for our living expenses throughout our retirement years. If it costs you $100,000 a year now to live a lifestyle, what's it gonna cost you to maintain that lifestyle 30 years from now? If it's 150,000, what, and we take it all out of a retirement account and it's all taxable, we're still in a high tax bracket. We're still paying taxes even in retirement. Maybe not our peak tax bracket, but we're definitely not in the lowest tax bracket at that time. Capital gains I mentioned are taxed at different rates. It used to be based on the brackets. It's now detached from the brackets, so it's based on your income. So if we're under, let's say, $40,000 and we have a capital gain on an investment, 
we actually pay 0% on that gain. So you can see the different brackets and, or the different rates based on income. And it's also based on our tax filing status. Are we single? Are we married filing joint? And so forth. So capital gains taxes play a role in our investment strategy. Here's what I mean by capital gain. When you go to sell your investment, you receive the proceeds or the sales price. You subtract off what you paid for that investment. That's called the basis. The difference is either a gain or a loss. If we've owned that investment less than one year, it's considered a short-term gain and that amount is taxed as ordinary income. If we've owned that investment longer than a year, we are taxed at the lower capital gain tax rates. Now the cost basis is made up of what you originally purchased, you know, what you originally paid for, plus all reinvestments over time. So we might buy something at $100 a share, but then every year a dollar dividend keeps buying more shares. So our average price is not the initial $100, it's something higher. So again, the higher the cost basis, the less the capital gain for tax purposes. So your brokerage firm will track your cost basis for you. That helps from a record keeping standpoint. Believe it or not, when you're selling multiple things in one year, the gains and losses get netted. So short-term losses off short-term gains gives us a net short-term, whether it's a gain or loss. And again, the long-term gains and losses are netted against each other. What if your net net is still at a loss? Well, your losses actually help offset ordinary income until they are used up. So hypothetically, if we have a $10,000 loss, 3,000 of that loss reduces our income for tax purposes that year, and we carry over to year two the remainder loss. And then again, another 3,000, another 3,000, then finally that last thousand. So losses are bad, but they are good from a tax standpoint. We wanna be tax efficient. Like we talked about earlier, doing the more income oriented investments in the tax deferred accounts, um, life insurance, life insurance related products are pitched to prospective buyers as a tax uh, advantaged type of an account. You got to tread carefully with the insurance based products. They have high commissions on them. They have surrender charges on them. It's a very expensive way to grow wealth, um, but they are pitched heavily to people. You hear ads on the radio all the time. Those are, you know, there's a high sales commission with insurance products. It's a very lucrative sale for the salesman. So they are willing to have large dinner seminars, invite 40 people, make one or two sales. That more than pays for the dinner for the other 30 people that didn't buy again. So we have to tread carefully with the insurance related approaches to investments. We talked about the retirement plans through work. If we're contributing to that pre-tax 401k, let's say 19,500 in calendar year 2020, and we happen to be in that 24% marginal tax bracket, we just saved $4,600 of taxes to do that. So we wanna take advantage of those employer retirement plans, not only for the tax benefit, but also potentially the matching dollars that your employer would provide to you as well. So again, our investment decisions actually do influence our taxes and vice versa. Remember when we showed you the retirement accounts, you either got the tax deduction up front, you get the tax deferral, and then you pay tax on the back end, or we did not get the tax deduction up front, we still got the deferral and it's tax free on the, on the back end. So you generally get two out of the three advantages. Of all the different types of accounts, you can see from this very ugly chart that I keep using, um, whether it's the company plans, maybe we get that tax deduction up front, or is it the Roth version, we don't. Um, taxable accounts can be tax efficient. Uh, I have the, you know, the, that they are potentially tax deferred. If you buy a stock that doesn't declare dividends, and then 10 years later you sell that investment, that was a form of tax deferral. Um, so a lot of people overemphasize you know, the taxable accounts, but we can be tax efficient with how we invest in taxable accounts. Notice I have the healthcare savings account, that HSA on there. That is the only triple tax-free account. 
contributions to that account are tax deductible the year they're made. Investments in that account grow tax deferred. And if withdrawn for a qualified medical expense, it is tax free. So it is actually, a, it's the only account that gives you a tax advantage in each category. College plans at the federal level are not tax deductible. They are tax deferred and if used for college, tax free. At the state level, using Pennsylvania as an example, you could get a state tax deduction. So at the state level, it's giving you the deduction, the deferral, and the tax free use. But at the federal level, you do not get a deduction on that. So again, we want to be you know, more tax efficient in how we go about investments. So let's throw it all together, give you some um, projections here. Let's go back to our assumptions. $100,000 year salary with a 3% raise. Let's say we contribute 4% to our employer's retirement plan. Let's say our career goes from age 26 to 65, and yet we live to 95. So we're working for 40 years, but we're retirement for 30 years. Let's give us a hypothetical rate of return of 5%. I'll talk about rates of return in a second. I want to use a more conservative one for this projection. The um, financial planning community has kind of drawn the conclusion that a safe withdrawal rate is that you withdraw 4% of your portfolio that initial year of retirement, and then you inflate the dollar amount of that withdrawal via a, a, an inflation rate. Let's say we increase the dollar amount by 4%. That doesn't mean we're taking 4%, then eight, then 12, then 16. It means we're taking 4%, and whatever that dollar is, we're inflating that dollar amount by 4% each year. Now, the contributions over this 40 year career would be about $300,000. And you can see that the tax deduction is netting us some tax savings over that 40 years as well. Here's what it would look like in, graphical, in a graph. Most people never think of it along these lines, but again, from age 26 to 65, we're making a contribution each year, 4% of our pay. Notice that that orange line has a slight curve to it. That's reflecting the fact that we're getting raises every year. So that flat 4% is actually growing every year by the amount of our raise. You can see the account value with that 5% hypothetical rate of return grows to a certain point. We're in our retirement years, we start to withdraw. That's what the green area represents each year. So our account value might be growing a little bit, but then eventually as the withdrawals get bigger and bigger and bigger, we drain the entire account. So again, this is what everyone is trying to accomplish without really ever putting it into a picture form. But again, that 4% contribution, we put in 300,000, we're getting the tax about $72,000 of tax savings over our career to do so. What if we had matching dollars? Again, you're, you're the employee, you're still putting in the same amount, here's it with a 50% match. So you can see that our, the account value is getting to a much higher amount, which means we're able to withdraw more throughout our retirement careers. So again, when you're evaluating various jobs, you're gonna look at the employee benefits that they offer, you know, health insurance, things of that nature, but you're gonna to wanna to ask about their retirement benefits. Do they offer a retirement plan? Do they offer a match on the retirement plan? Any questions on items that we've discussed? Think about your own personal goals, the investments that maybe you've done in the past, or what you're thinking about doing going forward. I'm gonna put my contact information up on the screen because simply you can always say, hey, I saw your video or I, I you know, was watching the class. Here's what I'm hearing, whether it's in the news, on the ads, your brother-in-law's telling you or whatever, say, how does this influence or how should I approach investments going forward. I always like doing these classes because I, I want to get people started out the front end of their career with a very solid foundation on how to invest so that eventually you won't need to hire someone like me down the road to do it for you. Great, thank you so much, Michael.
We had a lot of um, really good questions in the chat. So I'm just going to go ahead and share some of them. And then anyone with us, if you have additional questions, um, if you could just enter them into the chat and we'll get to them one by one. And then if we still have some additional time, you know, we'll go ahead and let you unmute and uh, share any other questions or comments that you have. So let's start with, there were some good ones here. Okay, so there were some questions about what is an IRA. I think we answered that in the chat. It's an individual retirement account. And then I think we've gone over that. If there's any other questions about the IRA, um, please do share them in the chat. A uh, question from Rebecca. So if I'm planning to buy a house in the next five years, is a Roth IRA a better place to put my investment than a savings account, Michael? If we're looking at five years, down the road um, and you only have so much money in your budget that's gonna be building up in that savings account, I would use the Roth as a good parking spot for that money between now and year five. However, knowing that we're going to make that withdrawal, let's say exactly five years from now, what you do inside the Roth IRA should have that, that safety mindset to it. So for example, let an, you know, not that I'm endorsing any bank over another, but at your bank where you would have your savings account, they would most likely offer you a Roth IRA account as well. And within that Roth IRA, you could do those bank type products such as a CD or a high yield savings account, something like that. If you subject any of that money towards an investment like the stock market, yes, you can definitely do well over those same five years. But what if you were buying that house in calendar year 2020? and you had this four or five year run up and then all of a sudden we get this 30 percent drop right when you need to write that check so it's a kind of a combination of how soon do we need to write that check how much risk are we willing to take you can definitely out earn but you can lose as well the reason why i'm suggesting the roth as the parking spot is what if five years from now our situation is totally changed where we're going to con either continue to rent or we have some other source of money to help with the closing costs and down payment and things like that, at least we didn't miss the opportunity to get the money inside that tax deferred account for calendar or tax year 2020, 21 and, and so forth. So if this was your only money and that's your goal, I still like using the Roth because whatever you put in, maybe we're putting in 3000 this year, 3000 for the next five years, you've got 15,000 of contribution that you have 100% access to, as long as you keep it safe so it doesn't drop in value. If you get closer to that time period, let's say it's year three, and you've decided, nope, the house is no longer my goal, at least the money's in the right account that you can shift how it's invested from very, very safe to very, very aggressive. So it's like, I wanna take advantage of the opportunity each year that you're eligible with one eye on when we're gonna use it and what the purpose of it was. So hopefully that helped. Um, you know, a lot of times early, in our, in, early on in our career, we might not have extra money where we're doing both the Roth IRA and the emergency fund. So again, if we only have dollars for one, park it in the Roth, keep it safe if we plan on using it in a short period of time. Great, thank you. Um, so we did receive a question about, do you need to be a U.S. citizen or green card holder to have a Roth IRA? I did do no, I, got, I got to look that up. I, I get that same question every class. Um, yeah, I did a quick Google search and it basically says it depends, you know, but a, a non-U.S. citizen who's legally working and living in the U.S. and paying taxes should be able to open an IRA. I, I believe it's, it's as long as you have a tax identification number. Yep. Yeah, that, that's probably the criteria. If you're eligible for a tax identification number, you would most likely be able to set up a Roth IRA. You, you definitely are subject to taxes each year and things like that. The follow-up question I typically get is, what if I move back home or something like that? The account still exists. It's still in your name and you still have access to it. Whatever year you eventually withdraw the money, you would be filing a tax return in the US for that year anyway. So it's not like you lose the account simply if we change countries, you know, the account just simply stays here. It's in your name. You still have access to it.
but when the withdrawal ever does take place, that could be a taxable event that would show up on a U.S. tax return that year. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Rebecca has another question. How about Roth IRA versus a high yield savings, like a Marcus account? Well, we're, t we're talking about two different things. Um, the Roth IRA is simply an account. Think of it as a shell. Once the money's inside that account, you still have to make the decision of what to do with it. So a lot of people have accounts at let's say Capital One for this high yield savings. Well, that account is a taxable account in your name. You could contact Capital One and say, I wanna set up a Roth IRA at Capital One and what you do with the money inside the Roth IRA could also be that high yield savings. So it's the actual same investment whether it's in a taxable account or inside the Roth IRA, the difference to you, again, they're gonna earn the exact same. They're gonna fluctuate the exact same way. The difference to you is if it's inside that tax deferred account, whether it's a Roth IRA, SEP IRA, whatever, you don't pay tax on the dividends every year versus if it's outside or in a taxable account, you are paying tax on that dividend every single year. So the account, doesn't determine the rate of return. But the, once you open up an account, whether it's a taxable account, a Roth, a 401k at work, a 529 college plan for the kids, the second decision is, okay, what do I actually invest in inside that taxable account or inside that college savings plan? So you can invest in the exact same thing in multiple accounts. They will perform up or down the exact same way but some accounts are sheltered from taxes and eventually, you know, the Roth version, the gain would be tax-free in retirement. So, you know, that's why we want to pick the goal. Why are we doing this in the first place? Then from a budget standpoint, allocate a certain amount of your resources towards that goal. And if we're committed to that one goal, then we pick the right account for that goal. Because remember, we're not using the college plan money to pay for medical expenses. We're not using our retirement account to put someone through college. So once you're committed to that goal, then we can allocate money to the right account. But we have to be committed to that goal. It can't be, well, it might be used for college. It might be used for that house. Then we can't put it into the retirement account or that healthcare savings account or whatnot because those are very specific to that goal only. Great, thank you. Any additional questions from any of our guests? And of course you um, have Michael's contact information here as well as his email. So if you are, uh, think of something that we went over today that you're just wanting more clarity on or, um, you know, once you get a chance to look over the slides which have now been posted on our website, uh, feel free to shoot him or the Graduate College a note I think we're all set. All right, Mike, thank you so much once again for joining us and sharing this information. You're uh, welcome. Looking forward to the next session. Us as well. <laughs> Everyone have a great afternoon. You too.